All right, so thank you everyone for joining us today in this special topics webinar series that we run in order to elevate cooperative management, governance, and leadership. If you weren't able to tune in to the last uh, webinar in this series, the first one, it was Living Our Cooperative Values, Applying an Intercultural Development Model to Achieve Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion with LaDonna Redmond. And so you'll be able to find her recording of that webinar at managementstudies.coop and all of our future webinars, the registration as well as the recordings will be available on that website as well. So I am Erin Hancock. I am the program manager for education and our team at the International Center for Cooperative Management are very pleased to continue to elevate the co-op economy through our online and in-person business education customized to our unique business model. So I'll note that we are currently accepting applications to our 2020 cohorts for the online part-time master's graduate diploma and certificate in cooperative and credit union management. So if that interests you, please do send me a message in the chat box here or find my contact information at managementstudies.coop. Okay, let's jump into today's webinar. So the title of today's webinar is Learn What Content Marketing and the Fifth Cooperative Principle Have in Common and How to Leverage It with Michael Jackson. That's right, the Michael Jackson. Uh, what you can expect from today. So if, if you remember the description of this webinar, I'll refresh. So content marketing is a strategic marketing process focused on creating and distributing valuable, relevant, and consistent content to attract and retain a clearly defined audience and ultimately to drive conversions. It's all about your audience, what they value, and how you can help educate them. And of course, that's the link to the fifth cooperative principle on education. So when done correctly, this helps create a relationship with your audience, which leads to trust. And if your audience trusts you, they're more willing to cooperate with you. And I'll tell you a little bit about Michael T. Jackson, who is joining us today. You'll see his image there. Maybe not the Michael Jackson um, you first thought. <laughs> Um, he's an experienced project strategist with a demonstrated history developing systems through brand, product, and process development. He is the strategic communications consultant at the U.S. Overseas Cooperative Development Council, as well as the principal for e-commerce SEO inbound brand management with Connect. Uh, I should spell it out: C O N N E C T N E O dot com. So we're very pleased for your time and expertise. You are our expert today to help us all in our good work uh, in, in cooperative management. And I will run a poll right now for all of our participants here to be able to tell us about your exposure and experience so far. So Michael and I have a sense of what people's experience is. So I'm gonna launch the poll. You'll see it pop up on your screen and respond with the best answer that most represents your experience. Cool. Um, well, the poll's running, uh, and thank you for that introduction, Aaron. Um, and yeah, I'm uh, I'm here today to share um, about content marketing, um, or another uh, phrase that gets bandied about is inbound marketing, um, which is a little bit more specific than content marketing. So we're going to stay general um, and hopefully provide uh, information that you can use um, that will help you. Um, either implement a content marketing strategy of your own or set you off in the right direction um, so that you can go about deciding how to do that uh, or <clears throat> prepare you to be a good client um, for a strategic communications consultant if you should ever decide to work with one um, to implement a content marketing strategy. Uh, I wanna be mindful of time, so I'm gonna dive right in. Um, okay, and Michael, I'll just say that I'll, I'll close the poll now so people can see your screen again, but we've got a pretty, pretty good split amongst all of them so it seems as though you know 30 percent say it's new to me 30 percent say some and folks say yes we do it but we want to strengthen it so okay great take it away super helpful thank you uh so yes we're using content aka inbound marketing method methodology for strategic communications um so i just wanted to sort of end the suspense um and get right out of the way what a content marketing and the fifth cooperative principle have in common um, and in my mind they're both about using education to contribute to the elevation of someone else um, which was why i was originally drawn um, to content marketing because it was as someone who's been in marketing for a long time 
I didn't like interrupting people um, to tell them about my product or service. Um, and when I discovered this uh, methodology, it just made sense to me. It sort of was the missing link. So it's about <clears throat> um, educating um, to help elevate someone else and uh, sharing helpful, useful, relevant information to solve problems and create new opportunities. Um, if someone has a question, you know, and um, your content um, is there to sort of resolve that question, you know, that's a great beginning to a very sort of mutually beneficial and harmonious uh, relationship. Um, what's the goal of this presentation? Well, I'd like to help you understand how this can help you deliver your message. And I was intentional about um, word choice there. Delivering our message is, is, is an advantage of content marketing because we can actually deliver the message that we want our audience to receive uh, right into the laps of our audience. Um, so we're delivering our message to create deeper, more meaningful connections with our audience and to create useful conversions for our organization. Um, so these are meaningful conversions where we've provided information that has helped our audience, our audience has felt helped, and, and now we're sort of on the same page and communicating with one another. Um, we're not um, throwing you know, spaghetti at the wall and seeing what sticks here. Um, I'd like to, for you to have a working understanding of the subject um, to empower you to learn more if you should choose to. Um, so that you can more effectively contribute to your cooperative in the area of strategic communications um, in accordance with the fifth cooperative principle um, which is to provide education training uh, for your members and elected representatives managers employees so that they can contribute effectively to the development of their cooperatives <clears throat> so what is content marketing ak inbound and i and i do this ak inbound because i want you to um, know that there are a lot of tools out there that are specifically branded <clears throat> towards the inbound methodology that could work very well in your content marketing campaign. So there's a lot of similarities. I would say that inbound marketing is um, messaged and branded strictly towards businesses and corporations. Um, and HubSpot um, is the company that has largely taken inbound to market. And so they, a lot of their resources are structured um, specifically around businesses and, and um, corporations. However, um, content and inbound marketing tools um, and methodology in a lot of ways are interchangeable. So uh, content marketing is a marketing methodology that attracts your audience by creating valuable content and experiences tailored to them. While traditional outbound marketing interrupts your audience with content they don't want <clears throat> necessarily, content or inbound marketing forms connections they're looking for and solves problems they already have. So that's what we mean by helpful and useful relevant information. Um, let's see here. Why is content marketing? As you can see, I've taken some liberties um, with the English language. Um, in a nutshell, it's to have deeper connections with your audience, um, but we do that um, by attracting our qualified audience to our organizational content, engaging with them at scale, and delighting them individually by providing helpful, useful, and relevant information aligned to subjects they're interested in anyway and formats that are engaging and enjoyable. We create engagement and conversions that deepen our connections with our audience, and that's what we want. Um, you know, we want to be um, providing the information that they need um, and, you know, that they'll be grateful to have, ultimately. Um, so how does it work? <clears throat> so attract, engage, and delight. Here's our little um, <clears throat> visual aid. So what we want to do is attract website visitors, social media clicks, content downloads, email clicks, blog reads, event attendees, donors, co-op members, customers, et cetera, with engaging content. Our content should solve a problem, answer a question, or demonstrate that we get our audience. You know, like, finally, someone gets me. Um, and why they're spending um, their time with our content. Our offers should be useful. Bad offers don't work. Uh, we want to educate our audience about our value in a way that's valuable to them. 
Um, and then we want to delight them over time. So we're going to continuously, proactively serve them content based on their interests and give them more of what they want. Um, looking specifically at some of the tools associated with this, you know, in our attract toolbox, we, we, we're going to use original content, um, videos, podcasts, blogging, social media posts, um, and social media dissemination, boosted content. That's all going to be driven by a, a sound content strategy, you know, that's intended to connect our content with our audience. At the level of engage, engage, um, we're going to create buyer personas. We're going to leverage email marketing and keyword tracking um, to create offers um, based on keyword scoring and new information sharing based on what our audience has indicated to us that they're interested in. And then we're going to delight them over time with continuously providing them good content, email marketing, follow-up, marketing automation, content for closed course corrections based on tracking. So I put this in here um, just to sort of offer my sort of 30 second elevator speech. Um, you know, I get asked a lot about what I do and it's kind of abstract. And so I, I, you know, one of my personal goals for this is to help make sort of an abstract concept um, a little bit more tangible <clears throat> to the audience um, on this call. So I'm going to attack or approach it piece by piece, but I kind of want to give you the 35,000 foot overview so in a nutshell content marketing works by creating a presence on the internet usually a website blog social or all of the above which acts as a platform to serve your expert expert content um, then by combining the cross promotional impact of, of original expert co content to an audience who wants the content we're creating anyway promoted across social networks blogging channels email marketing campaigns uh, with properly optimized website assets and content assets, we create highly qualified conversions. Our conversion methodology is self-reporting based on keyword phrases optimized into our content and other SEO best practices and can be used to steer future content strategies to pre-identified audiences. Um, it can also uncover new audiences, audience interests, and organizational targets based on audience self-selection um, while they're opting into our content. So, an example of that is, um, you know, I had a company that sold um, outdoor accessories. And um, one of the things they sold um, were these arches. Um, and, you know, we thought people uh, were, were using these um, strictly in their backyard, uh, you know, to decorate their backyard. Well, it turns out we had a whole audience um, of resellers um, who were selling these as wedding supplies. Uh, they were being used in weddings to help um, decorate uh, the scene. Um, so, you know, we created a campaign to help sell these arches to um, wedding planners. So in that way, you know, these wedding planners let us know that they were interested in something we had and they were leveraging it in a way that we didn't know. Um, and in that way, we created sort of a new um, vertical uh, for our product or uh, a new audience for our product. So <clears throat> through their self-selection, um, we discovered a new uh, business channel. So I want to talk a little bit about how to create this content um, that's so compelling. First of all, I think it's important that you we write about what we know and understand. I don't think we want to bite off more than we can chew. As content creators, I think we want to write about or we want to create based on what we know. Um, I use write, you know, because I think blog articles are tangible, but, you know, this applies to any form of content you want to create. If it's a podcast or, you know, videos or uh, infographics, you know, we should be um, covering what we know. As an organization, um, you're here to serve a purpose. What's your purpose? Your content should be tied to that purpose. Um, I also think it's worth stressing that our content should solve a problem for our reader. <clears throat> we should be providing content that enriches their overall livelihood in some way. We're not here um, just to talk about the features of our of our services. Um, now, the actual um, process of creating a blog article, you know, there's writing the article and then there's configuring it for uh, SEO purposes. So. 
I'm going to start um, sort of drilling that notion home um, at this point. You know, I think that you all should know that all blog, article, blog articles should have a page URL, H1 title, subheadlines at key points um, to break up the copy. Each article should be optimized with a keyword phrase. Um, each article is uh, evaluated based on proper keyword density. Um, they'll need a meta description. Your article should have in links and backlinks. Um, and the, the image attributes um, should be filled out properly with keyword um, meta information. Um, just a little insider tip, uh, frequent updates and reposts of blog articles um, and content actually help boost their relevancy over time. Um, so don't be shy about reposting an article. Um, they say that you should um, promote content that you create at least three times. You should spend as, at least three times as much promoting your content as you did creating it. Um, so just rule of thumb. Uh, your content should reflect your organizational goals and it should be aligned with your value proposition and brand values. So it's all about keyword phrases. Uh, I, this is something I would say at a presentation if, if you were a prospective client of mine. I think you know content marketing, digital marketing is can get very sort of clever um, and there's lots of new stuff coming out all the time um, and it can be distracting but I think you know, if this is your first foray into content marketing, you know, don't be shy. Um, the basics, the fundamentals are, will, you can still get a lot done just by what I'm sharing in this, in this foundational um, presentation, you know. So if you're just paying real close attention to your keyword phrases um, and doing a good job optimizing your articles, you'll notice uh, a substantial um, uptick uh, in your response. So, you know, just as a tangible example, what's a keyword phrase? Well, you know, technically when you type in the words dry cleaning near me into Google, you're entering a keyword phrase. So that's basically how it works. Um, your keyword phrases will be something different. You know, here are some examples, how to augment your electric bills with solar panels, the importance of gender equality, <clears throat> 12 point HVAC weatherization inspection, how to bake the perfect cornbread. So in each one of these, you know, there is a keyword embedded. Uh, solar panels might be the first one, gender equality, the second one, um, HVAC weatherization, and cornbread. E either that or how to bake the perfect cornbread. Um, our keyword phrases will shape our content, blog articles, social posts, um, and will be optimized by these keywords. Um, our keywords help match our content to internet searches and become the metrics in our reporting. Say, for instance, if we have a blog article on overcoming chronic pain and that blog article is performing very well, if we're a massage therapy clinic, we might know that our audience um, is struggling with chronic pain and we might want to develop some uh, services or additional content around that notion. Um, I wanted to uh, make you aware that if you were interested in doing keyword research, you can uh, leverage Google, the Google Keyword Planner and SEM Rush, which is actually a paid service. And I was just going to show you quickly what that keyword tool looks like. Um, so here we are. We're actually on ads.google.com. We've clicked on the tools and settings. Um, we pull up this keyword tool and let's say dry cleaning. We want to know <clears throat> how often that term is being searched. Um, this is Google's index here or Google's um, scoring algorithm. Um, 100K to 1 million average monthly searches is pretty high volume. Um, we can see that it's not actually being targeted very well right now. Dry cleaners probably aren't doing a lot of um, digital marketing, um, but it is a very popular phrase. Um, and if I were in the business of um, helping dry cleaners promote their business, I would have a lot to work with here. Um, but this is just a look uh, at the Google keyword tool um, for your benefit.
Okay, where was I? Too far. So it's about these keyword phrases um, and optimized content. So optimized content is content that's been built based on SEO practices, best practices. Um, it's then loaded um, into our website or blog, um, social channel, YouTube, Facebook, or Twitter. Um, as it's being loaded, it's um, configured according to SEO best practices to be served onto the internet where it can be accessed according to keyword searches uh, made into search engines. Um, the content is configured uh, using a website plugin. I use Yoast. I think it's pretty much industry standard. Um, here's a look at the Yoast backend. Um, these are some of the parameters um, that they're optimizing based on. If we take a quick jump back, um, those are represented here as well. Oops. Uh, page URL, uh, blog article title, the first line in the article, your meta description, image attributes, um, and they're also rated by Google on keyword density and placement. So here's a look at that uh, Yoast backend um, and how um, our content um, is optimized when it's loaded. Um, here's sort of a tangible example of what that looks like. Um, as we can see, our keyword phrase is auto repair. Um, Tom's Cars is deciding to create a page called auto repair. So that URL will render as tomscars.com forward slash auto dash repair. Here's that URL. You see that we want to have um, auto repair as a keyword render in the text. Uh, depending on the total number of words in your article, uh, you want to have that keyword appear, I don't know, roughly between three and five times based on the total number of words in your article. Um, but Yoast will tell you if your keyword density is high or low. Um, and then, um, you know, you want to let Google know what your images are. So you want to use that keyword phrase in the image alt attributes. Um, people don't really do this anymore, but there used to be um, a process of overusing keywords, and it was known as keyword stuffing, and you shouldn't do that. Um, Google's on to it. Um, so keywords are used to populate fields on the back end. These fields are then read by Google, indexed, and um, used for future access. So Google stores this information, and then when people type in um, auto repair, it serves them uh, these articles based on how you've optimized your content. Just a quick note. Yes, ma'am. We have a quick question. So this is from Gordon asking about, first, thank you uh, for your presentation so far. And secondly, so do you, or would you recommend the Yoast plugin uh, that you need to pay for, or is there value in the free version? The free version works great, uh, but it's never a bad idea to put, pay for your plugins either. They're typically pretty affordable. They're not too many. Super SEM Rush, it's not a plugin, it's a software service. It's $99 a month. That's a lot. Um, so, yeah, if the free version of Yoast is great, but if you want to upgrade, that's great too. And that's a good point. A lot of this, um, a lot of the software that's out there today, the free versions are great. Um, they will cap you and limit you. You know, Mailchimp um, offers a great free service, um, but as you start to grow and have success. Um, uh, the free version does become a little limiting, um, but thankfully you're achieving success by the time it's time to upgrade to the paid version anyway. So thank you for your uh, question, Gordon. I hope that answers it. We have another question that came into here. Okay, with okay. That. so sure. the question's on customer persona. Is our content supposed to be addressed to cooperative members or non-cooperative members? Well, that depends on your goal. Um, if you're trying to attract new cooperative members, then you might want to educate them on the benefits of cooperatives. If you're trying to improve your current member experience, then you'd want to create content um, 
that improves their current experience. And we'll get into personas in, um, in, the, in the browser's journey in a minute, uh, but that is a good point. You know, we do want to segment our, our content based on where our audience is in their particular journey. Um, and getting back to this way less um, interesting information, you know, I just, again, I want to show you where these keywords um, render um, in Google search results. So we use sporting goods as the keyword. Um, we see that the H1 um, or title tag uh, appears right here, sporting goods. So this is an optimized H1 sporting goods keyword search to exporting goods is the um, first search result. Um, and this is a look at what our meta descriptions will look like when we fill them out. So when you're building your, your page on the back end of the site, I wanted you to see how it renders um, in the search results. This is how this information here shows up in Google. So how does it work? So essentially, uh, we've written our blog article, um, we've optimized it, now we're loading it onto our website. This is a snip um, from a former client of mine's uh, blog. Uh, we can see, um, here's our keyword phrase, um, operational optimization for maximized asset performance. Um, so, you know, we're looking at how this keyword phrase fits into uh, this title. It's then promoted across social, um, attracting likes and shares, sending traffic back to your website where your blog article is hosted. All interactions with your blog are captured by Google. As these interactions add up, our blog's relevancy is improved over time, which is a key to Google's algorithm, um, boosting its rankings um, and generating more connection to your brand and message over time. And again, in general, content gains relevancy over time. I think. Um, it, it might be a misconception to think of like uh, website launches um, and blog article launches as um, creating sort of a big splash and sometimes they do but really digital content um, gains value over time so it might be a big deal internally if you finally gotten your website done and you want to launch it but your website is going to become more powerful the longer it lives on the internet um, and the more it's updated and the more people are connecting with it um, and really the age of website launches is sort of over. Um, we're now in um, the age of sort of organic development of website resources over time. Uh, so if you hear people talking about launching a new website or you know, keep in the back of your mind that web and digital assets become more useful um, and relevant over time as more people interact with them. Um, so social sharing, cross promotion, and backlinks of your content demonstrate rel relevancy and boof, boost ranking, which drive responses over time. Um, I wanted to drill down real quick on a backlink because um, backlinks are super important to SEO. A backlink is basically when someone references your content in their content. So they might link to something you wrote in their content. So they're linking back. Um, to what you've written, which again, to Google, that makes what you wrote or created more relevant. So backlinks are a very important tool um, to growing relevancy. If you worked with a um, agency, digital marketing agency, a backlink campaign might be something that um, they have built into um, their process um, when working with you. Um, so who is my audience? Um, this is sort of what we touched on earlier um, about making sure that we deliver the right content um, to our audience at the right phase of their decision-making process. So we can't create content that makes our audience feel understood if we don't understand who our audience is. So personas are another way to describe the personalities that comprise our audience. Our content should be geared to the personas that comprise our audience and should appeal to them at various stages of their decision-making process. I call this the browser's journey. Um, that's a modified phrase. It's typically referred to as the buyer's journey, but I like browser's journey because not all of our audience um, have buyers, they might have members um, or constituents. Um, so 
Uh, I've renamed it just for just so every just for transparency's sake as the browser's journey. Um, so, for instance, content for the awareness stage um, wouldn't be the same as content uh, for the decision stage. So, as we look up here, the awareness stage um, is when our inquirer is experiencing um, problems or symptoms of a problem or opportunity and is doing educational research to more clearly understand or frame and give a name to their problem. So, an example, my, my dryer, it blows cold air. It works but it blows cold air. I don't know what's wrong with it. I'm experiencing symptoms of a problem or opportunity, um, but I'm not sure where to go from here. So that's the awareness stage. So the consideration stage, our inquirer is now clearly defined a given name to their problem or opportunity and is committed to researching and understanding all the available approaches and methods to solve the defined problem or opportunity. So going back to our example, I now know that the heating element has blown out on my dryer um, and I'm now uh, considering uh, whether I should buy a new element myself, which element I should buy, who I should buy it from, if I should go down the street, buy it from a local retailer, buy it on Amazon to save some money. That's the consideration stage. The decision stage is um, now our inquirer has decided on their solution or strategy um, and is compiling a list of all available solutions in their given solution strategy and is researching basically to whittle down the list of how I'm going to implement my solution. And we want our content to sort of meet our searcher um, or inquire at these various stages um, of their journey. Um, and for each of you, you know, that will be different, um, but this is just something to keep in mind as you're creating your content. So like I was saying, content um, for the awareness stage won't be the same as content for the decision stage. Um, and um, the, we should be solving issues specific to each stage. And lastly, you know, I say create an editorial or campaign calendar segmented by keyword date, title, buyer's journey stage, content description, offer, and stick to it. You know, having that calendar um, to sort of indoctrinate your your plans for the future is a great way to make sure that you you do produce that content on a um, regular basis, whether it's you know one blog or two blogs per month, um, or you know whatever that uh, routine is going to be. Having that calendar will help you stick to it. And I just wanted to prove to all of you uh, that I've done it myself um, and that I create these calendars as well. So here's an example of a blog calendar. Um, they, they get pretty gnarly. Um, they've got lots of colors and, and, um, fields. Um, and, you know, if your blog editorial calendar, um, starts to get real colorful, great. I want to encourage you to make it even more so. Um, I also, um, threw a blog article in here so that we could, um, one, um, take a look at what an offer looks like as it's being promoted within a blog. You know, so we're, we're promoting our content, but we can also promote backend content in our content. So here's a blog article that was written by one of my clients. Um, and here's an offer that we appended to the bottom of the article. This is also an example of what a CTA is, which is a call to action. Um, we'll talk about that later on. Um, and, I, and I wanted to challenge you all to guess the keyword phrase um, in this uh, article that I posted. Uh, and if you guys want to offer any answers to what you think our keyword phrase is in the title, I'm curious. Aaron, are there any responses to my guess the keyword phrase in this title challenge? I'm watching, okay. Uh, clean energy. Yes, that's come from a couple people now. Close. Three people. Future. Well, think Same about energy. it in terms of think about it in terms of um, the client offering valuable information about their company that's valuable to the end user. Does anyone else want to contribute? Okay, 
Well, the correct answer oh, yes, is thermal, we have one. Power thermal power plants. Oh, okay. just came in. <laughs> thermal power plants. And their question is, do people actually search for that? <laughs> people um, might search for thermal power plant optimization or thermal power plant uh, maintenance um, or uh, situations specific to thermal power plants that have thermal power plant embedded in them. That's how we create that information that's relevant to them. Um, this particular client of mine offers um, <clears throat> energy services to power companies, basically, and helps them retro modify their power plants to, you know, either um, fix them after they break or um, do predictive maintenance strategies to keep them from breaking. So <clears throat> it varies by industry, uh, but yeah, um, sometimes people do search for thermal power plant, just not only thermal power plant. So I wanna um, share a little bit about buyer the, the buyer persona process, um, developing buyer personas, so what, is a buyer persona, how should I use it, and are they worth the effort? So in its most pure state, the buyer persona developmental process is essentially an intentional effort made to understand more deeply who your audience is qualitatively and quantitatively. When done thoroughly using interviews and survey responses, an organization can learn a great deal about their audience um, or affirm what they already know through the buyer persona developmental process. Having said that, um, if you're already somewhat clear on who your audience is qualitatively and quantitatively, don't become too bogged down in the persona development process. I think it's important to baseline um, these personas, create them, document them, um, know who they are and where they are in their journey. Um, but don't spend too much time on this. Um, you know, I've worked at agencies in the past. And again, this is sort of a look behind um, the curtain. And Sometimes agencies can spend more time on this process because it does take place in the beginning of um, the content methodology ramp up. Um, and just, you know, don't spend more than three to six weeks unless you have a very unique persona situation in which you have, you know, dozens or hundreds of, of different sort of um, audience personas. Um, we kind of know who our audience is. You know, it's it's good to do the exercise if we're doing it um, intentionally. Uh, just don't. If 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 you're if you're eight weeks uh, into a project and your agency is still telling you that they're still working on the personas, uh, I just want you to be empowered with that information. It doesn't have to take that long. Um, So now we've uh, moved into the engage um, phase of our attract, engage, delight um, wheel here. Um, and engagement is really just about our audience knowing that we get them. It's about demonstrating to our audience that we get them. Um, and that's how we foster these deeper relationships with our audience. So sharing content based on our audience's unique needs demonstrates we get them. And because you know we're using tracking, um, and monitoring techniques, we're letting our audience know that we're proactively wanting to understand them, that we want to get them. Um, also, by having conversations with their audience, you create genuine relationships with them. This type of communication can be done through social monitoring, surveys, email, or live chat um, and messaging apps. Um, you can also um, speak with them over the phone. Um, we should have a standardized message. I don't know if you guys have ever called um, GoDaddy or Carvana or eSurance, but their message, you know, um, is highly reflective of what they want to be perceived as organizationally. You know, GoDaddy actually says, in if you're on hold with GoDaddy, the the, the person who's speaking to you is like, you know, want to get started on a new website, got a new business idea, awesome. Like GoDaddy uses the word awesome um in their hold message so this is an example of you know how we can keep our message um, consistent and standard um, as part of the engaging process um, 
we should be attentive um, and encourage our staff to empathize with inbound website visitors. You know, when people log a form um, or post a comment on social, um, we should be responding to that. Um, and analytics data is a great way um, to get to know our audience better and to let them know that we're paying attention. You know, if we see trends um, with our content, you know, we should be um, bolstering those trends. We should be providing more content based on what we're seeing. This allows our audience um, to sort of know um, that we're responding um, to what they're interested in. I think we have about eight minutes left before questions. Okay, cool. And I have about not eight slides left. So we're, 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 we're moving. <clears throat> um, we're on point. So I pulled some slides <clears throat> of um, a former client of mine. Um, they're a lifestyle brand out of Luckett's, Virginia. Um, and, you know, the point I'm trying to make here is that our content should be a reflection of our audience. Our audience should see themselves reflected in our content. Um, but only if they're our audience, you know, we don't necessarily want people who aren't our audience to see themselves reflected in our content, only the people who are. Um, so we, our audience will feel understood when they see their taste or preference or aspirational concepts, design ideas, language, style, topics, brand attributes reflected back to them in the content that we produce for them. Um, and I thought these guys did a great job with that because um, they're fun. And you know they're selling cool old furniture. Um, their tagline, I think, is vintage hip, and they sell shabby chic. So the, they just have done a great job of engaging um, with their audience. So delight. Um, so delight is basically post conversion. You know whether we want um, to create new members um, or customers. Um, or, uh, you know, we want donors. Um, once that conversion has happened, we don't want to stop communicating uh, with our audience. So we want to give the delight stage as much time and effort as we've given um, the other two. Um, you know, our website should be helpful to a first time visitor, but people who've been with us for years should also um, be getting content that's relevant to them. Um, and we do that, well, I haven't got, I should have, we'll talk about email marketing first. So email is a great way um, to keep in touch. You know, we can create email workflows um, that trigger after a conversion. For example, we can send emails offering um, content, member queries um, and follow-up emails. Um, we can continue promoting content that's relevant. Um, we know at this point kind of what they need so we can continue to prove that to them um, with relevant recommendations over time. If we have the capability in-house, we can even create a separate blog or, blog or newsletter for members. Um, <clears throat> and you know, we can use email um, for troubleshooting and stuff like that, depending on um, what service or industry we're in. Smart content, that's what I... Um, so smart content varies based on um, who's viewing it. Um, going back to the previous example, you know, if we have a returning um, site visitor, they should, in the variable content areas of our site, they should be seeing something that's more tailored to them versus a first-time site visitor. Um, you know, so uh, a visitor might see a button that says download our guide while a member sees contact support. That's an example of variable content. Um, we can do the same thing with forms. If a visitor has already filled out a contact form, those fields should be different uh, based on more information that we want. So a first time visitor might put their name and email address. Second time visitor might put their industry and um, occupational title um, so that we can you know, greater segment them um, and therefore provide more helpful, useful and relevant information to them. Um, So that's smart content. Um, surveys and events, um, another way to delight our audience. Um, surveys help you um, determine if you're meeting your audience's needs over time. 
their their responses will indicate how well we're serving them, but they also um, provide ideas um, for how we could tweak our product or service. Um, and that goes back to um, possibly even creating new uh, service offerings based on what we're learning. Um, to the example earlier about the people using the ARCs um, or the wedding planners using ARCs. Um, and you know, um, events are great marketing opportunities. We're in the midst of one right now. We can even use our webinar recordings as marketing assets. Um, marketing automation, is sort of a big um, bucket unto itself, but we can basically use marketing automation um, to delight our customers because marketing automation is the process of storing audience, audience lists and habits. Um, and informing future content decisions. So we can um, schedule um, these workflows um, to kick in after a conversion has happened. Um, and a lot of these marketing automation tools come with their own um, analytics and reporting software built into them. So we can leverage marketing automation tools um, and their reporting and analytics software is to uh, know even more about our audience over time. Uh, marketing automation saves us time, drafting and publishing um, content. Um, it's just sort of a set it and forget it um, tool. Um, so it, it saves us time. Um, the information that we're providing is based on um, even more uh, rich data and uh, it helps us serve um, information that our audience is interested in based on their interests. But yeah, marketing automation is sort of the holy grail. Um, once we get you know, through all of the other stages in content marketing, I would say you know, maybe nine to 12 months into our campaign is when we would look at creating these workflows and implementing um, marketing automation. Um, and just to sort of give a rough timeline, you know, if you were going to endeavor into this, you know, the first three months would be set up, three to six months, you know, we'd start to see uh, website um, traffic um, and um, social um, numbers improving, you know, uh, and then, you know, nine to 12 months, you know, that's when we start to see content downloads. Um, you know, we start to create conversions, whether we're converting uh, our audience to members or customers or um, donors. Um, you know, we might see one of my clients saw an uptick first year of 43% in their sales. And by the second year, uh, they're up to 163%. So it's a process. You know, we need to be committed to the process. It takes the time it takes, you know, but I would say after the first three months, you should see an increase in site traffic in general. And then, you know, at the first year, you should see an increase in conversions. Um, yeah, and here are just some of the stuff I've been talking about. Um, I think as one of my goals was to make this more tangible, um, it was important for me to sort of share with you just a look at what I've been talking about. So. This is an example of a landing page. Um, you know, this is one of those forms I mentioned. If someone came to your site um, or clicked on one of these offers, this landing page would be served. Um, here's the uh, WordPress blog editor backend. Um, here's a boosted post on social. This is a CTA. Um, this is a MailChimp dashboard. That's just kind of a joke for any digital marketers who are on the call. Like. We all spend so much time in the MailChimp dashboard. Um, and here are some trusted brands um, that I personally use. Um, HubSpot, this is WordPress, MailChimp, Google Analytics, SEM Rushes is really changing the game. Um, they're fantastic. They are expensive, but if you've got the money in the budget, it's, it's worth it. Um, and then here are some uh, familiar brands um, that you may have already heard of. And yeah, if you're <clears throat> interested in taking the next step and you want to become a content marketer, um, HubSpot has free um, videos um, and a certification process. Um, 
they want people out there using this stuff and so they give it away they give away tons of free content this link basically will take you to content marketing shangri-la um, there's more information there there's uh, volumes of information there um, or you know contact a digital marketer near you digital marketing strategist near you and, and you can uh, partner with them on your next campaign and thank you very much for your time and attentiveness. I hope you've gotten a great deal out of this presentation. And uh, that's it for me. Okay, awesome. So I think you've definitely accomplished a couple of the goals today, <laughs> which was to try to make this whole process that we, we know to be valuable. We know that more and more it's in the ethos of how business runs, um, but you've definitely helped to make it more clear in terms of I guess the homework we need to do, and that's really the second big thing you gave us today is where is it that we go from here in terms of, okay, now we understand the process a bit. You've described a bit of the work that we need to do in terms of clarity around what it is that we're up to, who it is that we're trying to communicate with, and then to move that all the way through to how can we offer value to them and how can we put that into time and space at a frequency that, that really works. So. Thank you for all that homework. <laughs> Great job. You made it. That, wow. That is perfectly, that's a perfect synopsis. Yes, that's exactly right. <laughs> uh, and it's true. You know, we do have, we do have a responsibility to our audience um, to know them um, and share uh, content with them that helps them um, or that's relevant to them or meaningful. So. And especially yeah. because we have lots of folks from co-ops and co-op organizations on the call today, I think that you know, the idea of of selling, of the old method of marketing, if you will, of trying to interrupt people and sell them things they might not need, but convince them there's something wrong so that they do want to spend their money. <laughs> I mean, I, I would, you know, take the leap to say that that probably doesn't resonate with everyone these days in terms of what kind of businesses we want to run. But um, I did want to ask you, because we have so many cooperative associations actually on the call, um, can you say a bit about, if we are within organizations that maybe have a, a defined membership, like let's say we have a number of provincial associations and state associations here on the call today. So if they basically already have their membership, they're not doing a lot of outward uh, marketing to bring in new membership. How does this apply in that type of more closed context? Well, I, that's great. I mean, because, you know, um, that's what organizations like that are, are structured for, right? They really are set up to um, be resources. Um, so, you know, this is just a great tactic and strategy to use to get um, more valuable resources in the hands of your constituents. Um, now, there might be, you know, questions um, within um, an organization, you know, that people have that just haven't been asked yet. So I don't know that we necessarily want to assume we know our members as well as we think we do. Um, maybe we do, maybe we don't. Uh, but, you know, I guess what I'm saying is I, I don't necessarily think we want to turn off our um, discovery process around persona development and um, you know assume that we know everything there is to know from the beginning um, so if there's new things that we can learn you know we might uh, leverage uh, surveys um, or polls or you know email outreach you know we can also uh, look at what's trending so that we can um, provide content based on data um so you know we are still sort of meeting them at the awareness um stage uh in certain instances but you know we might say that this might be an en engaged heavy sort of campaign like we kind of have we've we've got our, our our members now we just need to engage them more deeply so let's look at data let's look at trends let's look at what our um members really are diving into and then let's elaborate more on that um you know we publish let's say 
a report that had all these findings in it, but what was the finding that stood out most in that report? And let's talk about that finding and how they can leverage that. Like what's um, most relevant? You know, so I would, yeah, let's deepen our engagements and let's learn more. You know, let's, let's take this methodology and um, apply it to that scenario. Um, and let's create a deeper engagement with our, with our members. That's great. I, I think that's a call to action because <laughs> for those of us who do take for granted that we know who's there, I think it's fair to say, especially if we're in organizations where cooperatives are our main uh, member, so to speak, or our main um, target audience, then within those organizations, there's people changing all the time. So to say that we always know that dynamic and their wants and their pain points is, is probably not true because those things are constantly changing. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Fact. <laughs> Irrefutable. <laughs> uh, yeah. And, you know, um, maybe we haven't changed enough. You know, maybe our audience has changed and they're adapting themselves to what we provide. Right. right. Uh, you know, so what do we have to modify about ourselves so that we can um, level up our offering? Um, to our members and our members might be telling us that if we look at the, the data that's available, we just, you know, if we're not doing that, we won't know, you know, they could be asking us for things that we don't know about. Makes sense. Okay, we've got a few more things from our audience here. So from Charlene says, this is great, good stuff. Gordon says, very well done. And Ravi has asked the question, how can we promote Facebook groups? Uh, well, uh, I mean, That makes me think of um, using sort of like direct mail to help grow your uh, your digital campaign. Like go to a different um, medium, right? Go outside the medium to drive interest back to the medium. So I would say you could do that for one. I think um, so. You know, like if you want to uh, create a poster, right, and, and put it on the, the first wall people see when they walk into your organization that says join our group, you know, so you can take, you can go outside the medium, right, and drive people back to the medium, whatever that is, or, you know, Facebook itself um, has good promotional tools within um, their own uh, environment. Um, so, you know, if you want to boost posts, or if you want to do a paid ad campaign to get people to join your group, you can do that as well. You can use email marketing to your list. Hey, we've got this group we're starting. You can send on an email with a link to join it. Uh, you could write a blog article about it, post that blog article and share it um, on your Facebook feed or your LinkedIn feed or your Twitter feed and drive people back to Facebook. So. Yeah, I mean, there's tons of ways to do that. Right. You could um, you could uh, second, call it Goodyear and, and put it on the Goodyear blimp. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was just say, can I get you for the next slide up? Because we've just got one minute left, just so people know what webinars are coming up. Oh, cool. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Awesome. But I I hope Ravi that was uh, that was helpful in terms of uh, a more specific response to to that question too. And I think going back through all of these slides <laughs> will also point to a lot of things that can help to grow that as well. So we can't thank you enough, Michael, for um, everything that you've offered today. I feel like we all just got a super deal. <laughs> oh, good, thank you. <laughs> all of your expertise, your years and years of expertise shared with us today in a way that was very tangible and, and helped us all know what to do next. Um, I'm getting lots of big thank yous coming in from the audience. So uh, that sentiment is, is well shared. Uh, I will highlight that we do have two other webinars left in this series. You'll see them on the screen there, one coming up March 24th and the following on April 22nd. We've also already had one, like I mentioned at the beginning in February, that recording's on our website. We will make sure that by the end of the day today, we'll also have this recording up on our website at managementstudies.coop. And uh, I mentioned program application time at the beginning, but you'll see more about our programs in the handouts here as well as at the website. Uh, again, this is a voice of Aaron, so if you do want to follow up with me on anything that we do at the center, I welcome you to do so. You'll see uh, my contact information on the website as well. 
And if anybody has suggestions or you want to be a featured speaker on a, an upcoming webinar, then definitely be in touch. We're planning for our fall webinar series already. So thank you again, Michael. Thank you to everyone. We'll hang on the line for just a minute if people have additional questions. Um, you're welcome. And thank you everyone who came. Um, I really hope that this was helpful. So thanks. Great. Okay, not seeing any other questions coming in yet. Yeah, I made myself a list already of, of the homework that I need to do. So <laughs> I very much appreciate this, Michael. Well, I hope it wasn't overwhelming. I think you found the balance between helping us all understand. And maybe sometimes it's good to feel a tiny bit overwhelmed. Maybe overwhelm leads to action. So. <laughs> <laughs> it might. It might also lead to us hiring someone to help us. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, a lot of great tools feature there too. Let's get back to. Okay, so I, we're at we're past the hour, so I see people are heading off. So we'll officially close and, uh, and I'll shut down the webinar here in just a minute. Okay, Carlos says, thank you from Caracas. Oh, wow, you're welcome. Uh, let's see, Gordon says, I can highly recommend the HubSpot courses, specifically inbound and email. Okay. And Charlene also said, uh, MailChimp for life. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, well, I will close things out. Thank you. You managed to do all of that in an hour. I'm very impressed. <laughs> and we'll post this up later. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to be here. And um, I guess we'll be in touch, Erin. Definitely. Thank you, Michael. Bye-bye. All right.